I don't know if you had uh, seen it before, but basically we ran this ad this year at the, uh, during the Olympics. And of course, for example, for ads to be profitable, we need to be able to analyze them. And uh, Class Royale is the, one of the, or the latest hit we have made. And actually, if you follow very closely the, the scene of uh, mobile games, you, you may have learned that Pokemon Go was this summer's absolutely number one hit, but yesterday we just managed to surpass Pokemon Go again. Which is... <laughs> uh, I'll try to keep this kind of uh, as a, maybe a case study or introduction to Supercell and how Supercell designs games and more about how we use information to help that. And uh, as, a, as a background, as uh, Lassie said, uh, I, I joined the company in 2012. My original background is actually in physics, theoretical physics. I was doing a PhD in 2012, and at some point I, I wanted to go into some kind of a <laughs> real work or, or something like that. And I thought that maybe this analysis could be a more simple one and I wouldn't have to bang my head all the time to the wall with the age-old age -old, uh, problems of science. But, uh, Little did I know, and I, I've learned that social science or understanding people's behavior is way, way more complex than that. All right. And uh, first, we'll go through what I think analytics at Supercell in general is. And I would say that we are <laughs> even, one could say, that kind of fun-driven or design-driven company much, much more than uh, data-driven. And it's more about being uh, data informed. We, the system works so that uh, all the live game teams have one analyst, such as me or data scientist, in the team answering to basically all the data needs the team might have, starting from basic KPIs like retention to more complicated ones like understanding players' very particular behaviors. In 2012, we only had Heyday out and we hired the first analyst. Then in uh, August 2012, we launched Clash of Clans, and that's when I joined. I've been with the Clash of Clans team since 2012, and nowadays we have about uh, 10 analysts, which I would say about half of them, or a bit more than half, work with the games in some sense, and then maybe four or five actually work in uh, purely marketing analytics. And for data volumes at this time, we, we collect about 10 to 15 terabytes of data a day. And naturally, some of it is more accessible than some others. And uh, I would say that some of the data we almost never actually touch. And uh, some of them are used, used daily. The basic things we, of course, need to give for everyone in the company, and we have a very open atmosphere at the company, so all the employees of the company actually get the basic KPIs every morning into their inbox, email inbox, which has stuff like how many players did we have, how much revenue did we generate yesterday, what are the key retention figures, and, and some others like customer satisfaction rules. The biggest impact I think we give is, that was also talked in earlier today, is the focus that we can look at stuff the players are doing in game and kind of help the design to choose if that's kind of uh, something that no one is all using. So maybe not even touch that because it's usually very difficult to change something that's not used at all because players or we as humans tend to kind of look at something and if we decide it, it sucks, we, we are very difficult to kind of sway to think that it's actually a good feature. So so the focus would be one of the imp most important things, that we know what the players are doing, so likely those things are the ones that we might want to keep on redesigning. Of course, we learn a lot from community and players themselves directly. Then the other part of my job would be to understand the business in general, like what, how is China doing now, and, uh, or what did, why did the retention go down in Asia, or what's the deal with uh, Android something somewhere, and just providing these kind of questions and answers to the team and also to the leadership 
uh, of the company. And in addition to that, we have some minor data pro products pro which, which use machine learning, but you can ask me later about those if, if you wish. And the environment is, if, if you play our games, you know that the, we update them roughly once in two months or so. So basically, that's the timeline in which we need to be able to analyze the latest update, give the feedback back to the team, and the team has to have time to actually redesign the thing if needed. So it's actually a pretty short time span and definitely a very difficult environment to do, for example, a long term AP testing to verify something like for, let's say, eight months. So we basically do quite little AP testing, but it's also a design question that we do want to keep the games very, very fair for all the players so that everyone has the same, exact same game and we don't, we're not treating them in any, uh, differently in any respect. We do have some minor AP tests though, but not, not much of it. Sometimes difficulties come in terms of the people either trying to hack or mimic the system somehow, or then the device data might be, especially on Android, a bit shaky, or then we're using third-party uh, vendors who divide, uh, deliver us data about markets or, in general, acquired users. But most of the in-game stuff, which I work with, is pretty reliable because they come from our own server, so we are sure that the data that the players are doing and the data is representing kind of the truth. And also, of course, basic thing that whatever we do, we try to keep it actionable so that it would actually mean something to the game team. And of course, we are sitting in the game team, so we are very, very much in kind of, uh, we know what the game team is talking about, so it's kind of easy to keep on the actionability part of it. And also accountability. We have one guy doing basically all the analysis for one game, so it's kind of a situation where this guy is usually pretty trusted and has to be <laughs> kind of accountable for whatever he's doing. So, And uh, this would be, a, since 2012, uh, I, I just gathered a few questions that come up very, very often. What's the daily job for me or any of the game analysts at Supercell? And one could be like, we have a lot of battles in game, like you saw in the video, that's for Clash Royale but also for the other games. And the main thing would be like, are the battles balanced? Or if not, what's wrong? And I would say that that's one of the biggest things we've been following for several years in Clash. And balanced might not mean that it's always super fair, but it might mean more that people are actually using a wide vari variety of troops because even if the battles were perfectly balanced, but they would be using just barbarians at some point, the game would get a bit repetitive and boring, and players would probably quit. So for us, the balance might mean more about people using a lot of tactics, and so that no single tactic would come, come up as, as number one. Also, in addition, we of course follow things like the tutorial flow. We try to improve the first, first impressions of the players, then there might be some specific issues with people not getting in after the new update. What's the, what's the problem there? That, that would represent a question that's something that needs a very, very quick answer, that, like preferably in minutes, because <laughs> it's kind of a hectic case if you have millions of players who can't get in to the game. So the whole team is basically working on that at the moment then. And then fourth question, very general one, kind of we have, for example, the video I showed of course, we would like to know what's the impact of that. And uh, usually those are the cases where we really need to wait. And especially if you think that it might be a brand value thing, then you need to wait even longer. And even then, you likely can't, can't really answer the question. Like, like Coca-Cola advertisement, it's very difficult, of course, to say that that ad was profitable or not. And the last one is my favorite, basically, <laughs> that gets asked a lot. Like, something weird goes on, like some graph shows that there was a dip somewhere. <laughs> and it's, it's me who gets the question about like, what happened? Why is that so? And usually that involves even talking about the metric, like does it even matter? Like why are we following it at all? Or if, if it's really something that we like to, 
like to follow. Maybe retention might be one of those, or if we suddenly lost a lot of players, we would like to, of course, understand why. So then there's quite a lot of... It's often pretty simple descriptive analytics about what kind of users are facing this problem, but also trying to find maybe the core issue, issue of the problem. Of course, and uh, for us to know, we, we need to collect, I guess this was, you called it <laughs> spying. So basically looking at what the players are doing, like if they build a house, we will send an event. And I don't actually have a slide about it, but after this event gets sent to some servers, there is actually a whole team working on the whole data infrastructure to get the data so that we can actually use that. And it's not always mentioned, but that's basically of uh, very high importance for us to have the capability to answer many, many questions in terms of like minutes, especially like if we have problems in, in the system. It's, it, it's something that we need to be able to answer. Of course, some, some things are not time critical and we can wait for weeks until we answer it. But some cases, some things we need to know pretty, pretty soon. Not real time, but, but quite, quite quick. And uh, I, I took this, uh, put this picture here because that pretty much explains most of what I do in games. Like we have a pretty clear problem, like we might be thinking about doing a new feature or looking at the older features. And it's a, <laughs> the question is very easy, like do the players like it or would the players like this? What do you think? But usually the answer or like where do you even start thinking about it, that's not very very easy or not even clear always. So quite a lot of my work goes into understanding the, the players in general and helping the game design to kind of create these mental images or prototypes or kind of player cases of, of what kind of players we have, what do they do, would this be of importance at all. But usually I don't know what I'm doing exactly, but I, I know the problem. Okay, and the next part, I'll, I'll go through some of the examples, and they are not exactly, but roughly in the order of since 2012, like how we started understanding the broad audience we have, what kind of players do we have. And the, the name of the game is already Clash of Clans, so it has clans at least there, so probably we would like to understand the cl clans to some extent. What was fun to me at the time when I, when I, when I joined was a bit fun to play a game called Clash of Clans where you actually can't clash <laughs> with the clans at all. Nowadays we do have clan wars, but at the time you could only basically donate troops, chat, you couldn't even share those battles you had, like not, nothing basically. But still it seemed like it was kind of a social glue of the game that there was a clan where you can talk and somehow collaborate with your players. So we wanted to, of course, understand how do the players organize themselves in this, this class. And this is a quite recent picture. Like on the left hand side, you would see that there are lots of clans that have maybe one or two or three members. And well, likely those are some very, very tight knit group of people who know actually real life too. And they just use it to kind of hang around and play the game and donate. Then there is a next peak at about 10 players. That would be a group of, uh, the 10 is the minimum to wage the wars between clans. So that's kind of the minimum where you need, you need to get 10 friends together to actually enjoy the game to your fullest. And it's clear that most, most tend to be there. And then the last peak on the right would be at 45. So the wars go such that you can wage wars in uh, increments of five, like 10 people, 15 people, 20, 25 or 45 or 50, but most people seem to choose 45. And it's actually because it's a bit more stable to have like 46 people in your clan because then you can afford to lose one and still go to this 45, 45 war and kind of get the full experience. But if you had 50 and even one left, you're 49 and you can't anymore kind of get the 50 versus 50. So people tend to get to 45. And there's another benefit the players have somehow, we didn't actually think about it at all. 
but the players tend to have these free spots in their clans, so they can visit, visit each other. And uh, this is actually a picture so that all the blue dots are clans, and the red, dots, uh, red lines would mean that someone from a clan left the clan, joined the new clan to visit, to chat, and then possibly coming back. But the fun thing is that, well, we didn't kind of, you would think that 50 people is enough so that you can talk, but you can easily find these clan groups like here, which is, there's at, at least 50 clans all together. So they somehow team up the clans, and actually if you look at the, the clans themselves, they are named also in a very, very similar manner, like, like mega something, for example, or uh, quantum something. And it's kind of this thing that all those mega people would be on the upper left corner, and they never visit the quantum people and vice versa, but they tend to, tend to still stick together. And that was something that was very kind of surprising to us, that people would do it to this extent, that they would form these 50 alliance, alliances, or sort of like uh, mega alliances of, of players. And, uh, and this is something that we don't, of course, do this on a daily basis, but the designers are very, very happy to kind of understand this kind of a social structure and the meaning, like how strong can the social structure or bond be in the game. Also here you can see a lot of these uh, two clan structures. They are so that the players have organized themselves into a kind of a main clan and then a feeder clan. So basically in the feeder clan you have to earn your kind of place and then maybe you will be promoted to the actual, actual main clan. So there's lots of structure going on, which you can alone, of course, you can de deduct that from the data, but when you have the data and you know the game, you can, you can understand the, the game pretty well. And then the one thing we look at basically all the time is, is the battles. And the, there was a tactic called Go Wipe, so it's Golems. Golems, Wizards, and uh, Pekka are Golems, Witch, and Pekka. And, but th this is a pretty long time ago. And, and we tend to update, like I said, the game every two months or so. And in those updates, we bring some new balance changes because we think that maybe one tactic is now getting a bit too like, restrictive, that all the players need to do that exact one thing because otherwise you're kind of losing out on something and there is no point to using anything else than the one winning tactic. So we need to kind of disrupt the balance to make the game more meaningful and renew itself. And this is just one example. Basically, we did a balance change. We introduced one single building into the game that would actually push back flying units. And it took basically the, the shift you see in the data is one night. The whole time span is two weeks. But basically, the players tend to learn whatever we do, they tend to find the new optimum <laughs> in basically a day or two. And that's, that's pretty remarkable. Of course, like if someone is attacking maybe one or two times a day, it's not enough for him to learn it yet. But since they're in these clans, there's 50 people, and they're kind of sharing the replays nowadays, or maybe even sharing it, of course, outside the game, or YouTube videos or whatnot. But still, the players are super quick to learn and adapt to the new, new changes. And, well, of course, we can't quite prove it, but I, I really believe that it's mostly because of the social interactions. And uh, we sometimes we follow what players are speaking, for example, in, in Facebook or wherever, and this is just one example related to that Go Wipe update that we just did this checked checked what kind of things, things the players would follow or talk about when they're talking about go wipe. And in general, if you look at these words here, they're mostly positive. So people were very, very happy that the go wipe tactic was viable once again, because we had disrupted that maybe nine months earlier. Of course, data. In addition to us understanding our own games, we can follow, for example, social voice of sh uh, share of voice, or whatnot for, for our competitors, and this is a kind of a 
example of what we might want to understand, like some games, let's say, for example, Pokemon might be, it's not here, but Pokemon might be such a huge thing that we also see the impact in our user base because, of course, players only have 24 hours a day like everyone else. So basically, we would try to understand what's going on in the market beside us and if that's actually correlating with our user base or what they are doing, like are we losing some customers due to maybe Pokemon Go or something else, and we would just like to understand. That's not, of course, it's not very actionable. Like if we learn that Pokemon Go was the thing, we're not still going to go book Pokemon Go in Clash, but at least we understand that that's the thing, not something else. So it's, again, kind of helping focus in the sense that you now know the likely answer and you, you can go, go with that. And uh, in general, I think this is a very general remark. We follow quite a lot of averages, averages in, in the gaming industry, and basically all the metrics tend to be somehow power lawed or so that they are very, very skewed into so that 10% of the people explain 90% of whatever ever is happening, basically. So let's say revenue or whatnot. And for that, I think it's very interesting that most of the businesses seem to follow, at least in gaming, they usually follow lots of uh, averages rather than medians or distributions in itself. And I, I, I just think that, for example, the way Supercell is working, that we have the analyst actually in team, there is always one, one guy who is at, hopefully at least looking at also the whole picture and the distribution and trying to understand, for example, what kind of players are the ones that uh, play most or bring the most revenue, and then give the mental picture of that back to the game designers, rather than looking at the average player who probably doesn't even exist. And then it's very, very tricky to kind of uh, design a game for someone who doesn't even exist, but rather look at the subgroups of people. Of course, it's Everyone calls it uh, segmenting, but and it has also problems. Like you usually need to choose the groups you're interested in, and it's it's, it's a very very delicate business business in in general. And uh, also, as we are working with the designers, it's uh, it's very important to visualize it in a way that maybe it's not understandable, but it's at least interesting. So so then you get to get to explain it all. And uh, I think that's, that's one of the biggest things in my, my job also, to visualize the whole in, in important thing. Like here, the last bar would be the one that means all the other bars don't mean much. And this is, con this is the conclusion. I'm not going to read it out. You, you can read it. But uh, I, would, I would conclude here. And uh, thank you. And uh, I'll be here. <laughs>